Good evening, everyone. Oh, good morning if you are in a different parts of the world. Uh, there are probably attendees from both both uh, Asia and, and uh, US. Uh, my, my name is uh, Xinjin Chao, and I'm the program chair for, for the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. Uh, after, after working for, for the industry for about 30 years, I retired from ExxonMobil. Uh, last year, very uh, excited to be uh, part of this uh, uh, alumni uh, community. Actually, last month when I, when I was in, in Shanghai, had a chance to talk to uh, the MIT Shanghai Club. Last week, uh, or oh, two weeks ago, when I was uh, at MIT uh, campus, actually uh, took this photo, the cover photo uh, from the a new MIT museum. I thought it was a good background to, to start the. the, the we, with that uh, uh, four lines, that's actually taken from the new MIT Museum and describe what MIT is. I'll read it. MIT is not a place so much as it, it is a unique collection of exceptional people. What is, what is the essential here? Uh, asking questions that others are not willing to ask. Try unexpected in pursuit of a great solution. Willingness to work hard, even in a situation of a, uncertainty and embracing distinctive skills and a combination of talent. Even with all those skill and talents, uh, we uh, as a group uh, often still face a lot of challenges in our, in our career, struggles, setbacks, and challenges in our career. Tonight, uh, we, we are very excited to have this special session as a part of the MIT, uh, M MIT uh, CAG uh, events, a uh, panel discussion uh, for, for about career growth, about challenge leadership uh, uh, for, for this community. Uh, all the four uh, members of MIT alum uh, alumni who are working in various uh, fields has, has uh, very successful careers in whatever field they are, they are pursuing. Eric uh, uh, is, uh, I guess, Eric mostly in the technical area uh, in his uh, uh, career. Humphrey is an entrepreneur. Sophia is, uh, uh, I guess, in a le legal profession. Uh, Yinsha is mostly in the commercial and the business. So I obviously all also have, uh, have been in various uh, kind of a management position as well. They are very excited to, to come here to share with their, about their experience with the uh, with them, I, I hope all of us can walk away from the discussion tonight, feel encouraged, feel empowered, and inspired by their experience. Uh, I'm going to ask the four panelists to, to uh, give a very short self introduction, three, four minutes of self introduction. After that, we're going to start the QA session. Uh, with that, uh, let me start with the, because most of the time I start with alphabetical, I'm going to start with the reverse uh, alphabetical today, so, so that the two ladies can go first. Uh, Yinsha, go ahead, the uh, uh, floor is yours, uh, give a quick introduction of who you are. Yeah, thank you very much, Xin Zhao. And um, it's really a great honor to join this group. I actually didn't know that there is a Chinese alumni <laughs> group. So i um, very excited to, to join this and uh, share with you um, some of my experience and also look forward to the great discussions here about uh, leadership. So my background real quick is um, um, I graduated uh, um, from MIT in 2009 with a PhD in engineering system divisions. Uh, many of you probably have not heard of it uh, because it's not one of the traditional disciplines at MIT. And it actually, is, it, it doesn't exist now. It's renamed to be like IDSS, uh, Institute of Data Systems and Society. But anyway, that's when, where I did my PhD. And after that, I joined the energy industry uh, many years working as a consulting uh, consultant. And then um, more recently, I joined Google and leading the clean energy procurement for their data center portfolios. So that's a very quick introduction of myself. Back Thank you, you Isha. Uh, Sophia? Hi, my name is Sophia Lee. Um, a pleasure to uh, be here with this group here today. Uh, I am Chief Legal Officer uh, of Altus Power. Altus Power is a clean energy company. Uh, so what we do is we build, own, and operate commercial scale solar systems. 
and provide energy and all the benefits of clean energy to the customers uh, across the country. Um, and you know, this is a fairly new industry for me. I've been in this uh, company as chief legal officer and also recently appointed chief sustainability officer. I've been here for two years. Uh, prior to that, I started off my career. I was a class of 91 mechanical engineering graduate. So I did a bunch of kind of more technical jobs earlier in my career with the Morgan Stanley as a technical associate, for example. Um, but believe it or not, MIT has some amazing pre-law classes, if you guys don't already know this. Uh, and I got really interested in law as well. So I ended up going to NYU Law School uh, after my a couple of years at Morgan Stanley. Uh, I joined a large law firm in New York City called Paul Weiss doing corporate law and M&A. Uh, from there, I went to several in-house positions, mostly in the electronic trading uh, and stock exchange space. Um, prior to Altus, I was also the chief legal officer of a national securities exchange uh, called IEX. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's that's a good summary for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, I think next, uh, Humphrey, thank you. Yeah, cool. <clears throat> so my name is Humphrey Chen, uh, co-founder and CEO of Clipper. I'm also the uh, president of MIT Chinese Alumni Group. And so the, what Clipper does is we help you to find the most important moments inside of your recorded video. So we make it searchable, we make it queryable, and we actually make it um, more actionable. And so prior to uh, co-founding Clipper, um, we, uh, I actually was the head of computer vision at Amazon Web Services. Uh, and so you know, doing machine learning and helping uh, developers to see and hear at scale. Uh, but, you know, career wise, I would say I'm a corporatized entrepreneur. So in addition to having worked at uh, Amazon, I also used to work at Verizon as well as Microsoft. And actually, uh, Sophia and I were both at uh, Morgan Stanley together uh, in the early 90s. Um, and I also have an MBA from Harvard Business School. And so, um, yeah, so in a way, I, I'm, I'm very much highlighting the uh, entrepreneurial path but I have a mix between uh, big companies and, and taking ideas and making them happen in the real world, but then also making new things happen inside of uh, big companies. Oh, th thank you, Humphrey. Uh, Eric? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Eric Chang. So uh, currently I'm uh, sort of advising startups, uh, especially in the AI and healthcare space. Um, so I graduated from MIT with my PhD in 1995. And then after that, I joined a startup uh, in the uh, Bay Area called Nuance Communications. So I was there for four years and uh, sort of was the sort of starting members of the uh, R&D sort of operation there at Nuance. And then after that, uh, in 1999, I moved from uh, Bay Area to Beijing when uh, Microsoft Research Asia was getting started. So I actually stayed at Microsoft Research uh, for over 23 years until uh, March this year. So, uh, so through that time, I work mostly in the area of uh, sort of human computer interaction, right? especially uh, speech related areas. And also later on, we we'll work on uh, AI plus healthcare, and for example, using a uh, computer vision to do uh, mental image analysis. And um, so, so today, I think uh, I have a mix of experience of working uh, sort of R and D operation for both uh, Microsoft Research, where I stay the longest. I also worked for uh, General Electric during my uh, six day co op uh, back back in the uh, I guess eighties, and also. Um, I've worked at for uh, Toshiba's uh, corporate research lab, and uh, I've worked also in startups as well. So, so it's really like an interesting contrast between uh, very large companies and also very small companies. And uh, so, uh, my work has primarily been sort of in the boundary between uh, sort of research and like first version product, sort of like the version zero to version one, essentially. So uh, that's that's where I find the most excitement. And uh, so, so I, I know there are a lot of people who are sort of considering starting companies or like uh, sort of uh, or Know, whether to pursue PhD versus not going into the industry right away. So I hope to share uh, some, some of my thoughts and experience in that area. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the panelists all ha have or had uh, very impressive uh, career paths, a very impressive uh, accomplishment. Uh, I'm going to start asking a few questions, but uh, for the audience, uh, if you have a question, please feel free to, to type in the, I guess there is a QA panel. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm going to start with a few questions, but uh, we'll, we'll pick for the question from the QA. So feel free to enter your question from there at any time. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Yun Xiang. Uh, maybe uh, how, how did the MIT education help you to prepare your career success? 
Yeah, thanks for that uh, great question. Um, I think there are two ways that MIT really helped me and, and really just uh, changed my whole career path. Um, one of them is like, it really prepared me with the quantitative skills. Uh, I mean, we all know that's what MIT <laughs> do really good Excel, I, but I didn't realize how much benefit it gives me until I, um, I graduated um, because in my work as a consultant and, uh, and in, in later on, you know, joined the, the energy industry, I can really see like I pick up on the quantitative analysis really quickly and actually uh, it's one way that I distinguish myself from my peers. And uh, many of the things I can just go back, okay, you know, I learned that or I, the, the foundation was built from my study at MIT. So um, that is the one thing I really, really appreciate to the, um, the MIT. And the, the other way, the, the other thing I think really profoundly changed my career is that it, it, it exposed me to this energy industry. Um, I was chatting with Xinjin recently, like uh, um, the reason that I got into MIT was uh, because the job that I took before MIT was with a, a um, Fortune 500 consumer product uh, company. I was working there and, you know, salary pretty well paid, but I just didn't find my passion. I don't know like why I'm working in that industry. So uh, I decided to just uh, pursue a more advanced uh, study and so got this opportunity to study at MIT. And even while I was there, I still had no clue about what I would be interested in doing in my career. However, at MIT back then, um, Susan Hockfield was the president and led the MIT Energy Initiative. And that really, uh, I think, started initiated many of the um, energy researches. I mean, of course, like our, our MIT already has had a lot of uh, energy related researches, but uh, that energy initiative really put it on a different level. And so I went to different kind of seminars and just got to know this uh, great research topics like on the future of coal, the future of nuclear, all of these. And it let me think, OK, I grew up in Inner Mongolia, which is like uh, the lead coal producing provinces in China. And all the energy and environmental issues related to coal really like uh, concerned me, like it uh, deeply touched me so that I feel like that's where I wanted to actually work on and contribute. And uh, and so I, actually after my PhD study, I was able to got a um, postdoc opportunity at MIT Energy Initiative and, and so started my journey there. And it uh, after I, you know, now working with the energy industry for about 15 years, I just feel like, uh, you know, that that is really um, something that I feel appreciated as well. Like it opened this world that I really feel passionate about. Um, yeah, so oh, I think it's profoundly really like <laughs> Thank, thank you, Yinshan. So that I guess you know you mentioned the two things. One is the quantitative the, the skill. The other one is MIT allows you to expose to to the clean energy. That's a, that's a, obviously a topic uh, the whole world is is focusing on. So that's the two things. Uh, next, maybe I'll ask the other three panelists uh, any, anything else you want to add to to what uh, Yinshan mentioned about the question of. Uh, how MIT education help you prepare the, your career success? <clears throat> One thing I'll I'll uh, I'll add is um, since I was course fifteen MIT, and then in a way I had quantitative business, and then I also had qualitative business at Harvard. The two ended up being very very different, um, and in one respect. Sloan ended up teaching me, you know, hey, go get the answer. And in that sense, uh, it assumes very much a black and white world. Um, and, and it, you know, candidly, it's a little bit more engineering uh, centric. Uh, but if I then contrast that with Harvard, where because of the case study method, you end up, when you answer a question, you're forced to actually explain your thought process and logic and, 
And because a lot of the business world is actually gray, people just assume that whatever your recommendation is, is correct if they actually agree with the thought process. And so I highlight that just because uh, the two are actually very different, right? And in this case, it ended up being very complimentary for me. Um, but one thing that uh, the engineering view of the world trains all of us to do is to like find the answer. What's the answer? And, you know, in the engineering world, there is an answer, but in the business world, uh, there isn't always an answer and it's not a definitive answer. Um, and, and so I, I kind of wanted to highlight that because there, there were things that uh, jumped out in terms of, uh, and I, I, want, I figured it would be useful to kind of contrast that too. Thank, thank you, Avri. Uh, Sophia and Erica, do you have uh, anything else you want to add? Yeah, I think one of the things that stood out to me the most about my MIT education, I was course two in mechanical engineering. So there were so many different labs that I found interesting. I worked on like a thermodynamics lab, a cryogenics lab, um, you know, worked on a uh, robotic car lab as well. There were so many chances to try new ideas. And I think that experience made me not afraid to kind of take on new challenges. And I think that's really what's helped me throughout my career because at each juncture, of making a choice to either move to a new company or a new position. Um, like I was not afraid to just try it, even though I maybe felt it would have been safer or easier to stay at your current job. You're already making a good salary. You have a good title. People already respect you. It's really a big risk to take on a new company. Um, and for example, I mentioned I was working mostly with financial markets prior to this clean energy company. So I spent a couple of decades you know, building financial markets uh, getting stock exchanges approved with the SEC and designing stock exchanges. And then when I got this opportunity to start a clean energy company, I wasn't afraid of the challenge because I felt like MIT prepared me so well that I could solve any problem. Um, and I think that just gave me the courage to, you know, kind of take uh, more risk uh, throughout my career. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sophia. That's an excellent share. Uh, Eric, you want to add anything or? Sure, I, I think that uh, I mean, uh, as, as previous uh, panelists mentioned, right? I mean, it's very important that uh, MIT provide the opportunity uh, for people to uh, learn and explore in different areas, right? And that's that's my experience in, in the sense that um, I mean, they've been saying that uh, MIT, you know, what's what you learn is not as important as learning how to learn, right? And then, then certainly um, MIT, certainly you are given that opportunity to learn about many different subjects. And, and what I love about MIT is that there are a lot of different uh, talks from different disciplines. I mean, you can go to Sloan and listen to uh, CEOs talk about how they meet challenges in the company. I still remember uh, you know, Jack Welch you know, was, was at MIT Sloan. He gave a talk and uh, like, left a very strong impression. And, uh, and, and so, so that kind of opportunity where at MIT you can sort of like continue to learn and sort of like find new, new perspectives. And also, there are many different uh, disciplines that you can uh, either do talk to the professors in those disciplines or also to, to listen to talks. I think it helps to broaden one's sort of area of knowledge. And um, it's sort of like, uh, like Charlie Munger has this analogy that you should have like many, many different mental models on how to uh, so analyze the world, understand the world. So MIT really uh, has this uh, great set of uh, disciplines and also opportunities to actually interact with the experts from all around the world in different subjects. Okay, that's excellent. I, I, uh, I'm going to sh share a little bit of my perspective. Uh, I did my PhD at MIT 88 to 92 there, but the, the two things uh, I, I reflect uh, my experience there. There, The first one I mentioned was uh, uh, a lot of the stuff you work at MIT is a sole frontier. I remember this is a 35 years ago, almost a 30, 35 years ago, we were working with the text messaging, emails and stuff. At the time, there was no such a thing in the world, really. We were working on the, the, those kind of, you know, I remember I wrote my thesis on LeetX, so even today, uh, a lot of people still use Latex for, for writing books or publishing stuff. So you, you always have the chance to work on stuff. It's really frontier uh, in, in, the, uh, tech, in terms of the technology. The other aspect of my experience was uh, uh, really the education really drive the concept of actually doing things around. It's learning is important, but actually doing is much more important. Uh, in, in a way, by doing it, uh, I remember the first year I worked at uh, uh, Chevron for, for a summer, actually, that's uh, 89. 
half of the problem really is to figure out what the problem is. Of course, the solving problem is, is a part of the education, but uh, the other part of the actually is to figure out what the problem is. It really is to help you to, to uh, how to think uh, before you how to solve the problem. Uh, those are the two things I, I would share. Maybe, maybe as a follow up that uh, obviously you all have worked uh, in, in the industry uh, for quite, quite a while, a decade or two. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, one of the questions a lot of us uh, uh, in Korea always struggle is uh, how do you define success? What is success? Uh, what does the success mean? Uh, maybe for this question, I'm going to start with the Eric. Uh, uh, share a little bit your thoughts. Obviously, you had a very successful career, but uh, uh, how, how do you define success? Well, well, I think um, success is definitely a very uh, individualistic uh, sort of like a uh, concept, right? So, so I think most importantly, I think that one needs to find what one wants. I mean, what to know thyself, right? And then, and then my my personal perspective is that if you can find a career where you um, you essentially have like four factors that are, that are satisfied, right? One is that uh, you have the capability, like above average capability, of doing better than other people, and you actually sort of doing something that uh, you can actually um, excel at and number two is something you have passion for that you really enjoy doing it i mean uh, i mean ideally something that really is not a nine to five job is that something you would enjoy thinking about on the weekends or on the drive you know to work or things like that right where you really have a passion for that and number three is that uh, it's actually sustainable in the sense that there's enough uh enough payment or, or whatever so compensation that you feel that is something that you can actually sustain and then do a long term because I think uh, for a career really you won't have uh, this kind of long term uh, commitment you, you don't want to sort of like uh, go from like one to another like in a very rapid succession and uh, that, or and sort of have a long term roadmap in, in, uh, in mind and number four is meaning right in, in the sense that longer term you, you find that at the end you said oh okay well some of the you know, tens of years of, in, in this career and uh, I actually derive, uh, in addition to all the different factors, like uh, you, you had fun and you had well conversation, conversation and also um, you were good at it. You actually uh, derive mainly you feel that it was meaningful use of your time and actually generate some benefit for the world and the people around you. I think if you can uh, find a career that has those four factors so satisfied, I think that that would be a very, very good uh, career. Oh, thank you, Eric. That's a very thoughtful answer. I'm going to ask the other three panelists uh, anything else uh, you want to add on uh, Eric's comment. You don't have We've to, got, but uh, if you have yeah. something to add. I mean, uh, one, one, one bar that I set for myself was to have societal impact, uh, which actually is a non-trivial thing to make happen. Um, you know, very few people are able to you know, have the kind of impact that, that like Elon Musk has, but you know, in our in, in my case, you know, if I come up with something and what I end up building becomes a verb and everybody can't imagine life without it, then, you know, in that case, not everyone, but a segment of the population uh, can't imagine life without it. Then, um, you know, so so for me, I've been striving for for that level of kind of meaningful impact. Um, and, you know, but there is a risk associated with having a bar that is too high because you know if if it's too high then you may or may not accomplish it right and so like earlier in my life i had like simplistic monetary objectives and then once those objectives were you know meet you know reached then you're like okay well what next and and so at that point you end up trying to like change the goals um and so in a way uh you know i think a lot a lot of eric's points are are, are spot on because you do need to strike a balance um, and there's something to be said about aiming high, but then there's also the risk of it being too high. <laughs> Thank you. That's an interesting perspective. Uh, uh, <laughs> how about Insha and Sophia? You want to add anything? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think, I think Eric said it really well. Um, I think for me, success is being able to uh, make an impact in something you're passionate about. So, uh, for example, at my prior job where I was uh, the GC of the Investors Exchange, you know, it was a brand new stock exchange um, that we were starting up to compete with the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. It was basically to level the playing field so that high frequency traders couldn't 
um, game the system. So of course, you know, the incumbent exchanges like New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, the HFTs themselves were against our model. So, you know, it was a really lengthy process to fight throughout the SEC comment process. Uh, it took about two years to get our exchange approved, but, you know, I, I found a lot of um, value in basically, you know, disrupting the market and making a change for good. So now that there's this um, venue that long-term investors can feel safe in trading, I felt there was a lot of impact and like my work actually had meaning. So I thought, um, I felt like that was a good kind of like career success. Um, and in which each job I take, I try to see what kind of impact I can make, you know, like kind of like change for good uh, and do my best to achieve that. Of course, with all the balance that Eric mentioned, <laughs> making sure that, you know, such uh, hours and work effort are sustainable as well. Okay. Yeah, I agree yeah, with all the uh, panelists. Yeah, um, I huh. think I, I agree with uh, what all of the three panelists uh, said. Uh, and for me personally, I think uh, uh, what I felt uh, more strongly is about this uh, freedom to do what you are passionate about and achieve uh, what you wanted to achieve, like as a result or as the impact on society or on whatever you think would be like uh, what you're willing to do. I think no matter if it's like, okay, you know, in a big company or in a small company, um, as long as like, a, you know, you have the capability to set the direction and move there, I, I call that a, is a success. Thank you. The, the, if you if you hear all the full panelists, I kind of broadly think about this way. Everybody touched on two aspects. Really, it's a success is two dimensional. One one dimension is about your personal satisfaction by, you know, the, whatever you are doing. If you feel passionate, that that's a personal satisfaction. That's one dimension. The other dimension is more external recognized being recognized you did something uh, fantastic you did something impacted the society or impact or have influence in certain business decisions so think about success i tend to think about success in that two dimension of course in the end uh, all we do in the end uh, i i think uh, humphrey said uh, used the word uh, impact it's uh, in the end of the day uh, it's an influence and the impact to the society or influence to decision making. I think that's probably is the best way to define uh, what we do in day in day out. Uh, uh, if you if you know that uh, nobody said uh, uh, about success is defined by by money or promotion, those things naturally important. Uh, I tend to think those things uh, only last about a week or two, and you go back to the same places. So, Success is defined really much more fundamental uh, than, than the, the uh, you know, short term reward. Uh, thank, thank you for all the wonderful uh, share from, from the panelists. Uh, I mean, you know, today uh, in this uh, uh, dynamic world, uh, everyone uh, used to be leader. It's, uh, uh, people tend to think about you know, Jack Welch is a leader, Bill Gates is a leader. Think about that way. Nowadays, the concept of leadership has shift, fundamentally shifted in the last uh, whatever year. Everybody is expected to be a leader, regardless of what position you are, regardless you are a manager, you are a CEO, or you are a scientist, or, or you are an engineer in the field. Everybody is expected to be a leader. So the definition of leadership has changed uh, a lot, and how everybody Think about leadership is also different. I'm going to ask Humphrey uh, a question, a uh, next question. Do you consider yourself a leader and why? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, I think when I, I reflected on this question and I thought through kind of my progression in life, you know, in a way, like in a circus, there's like a ringmaster and the ringmaster controls everything that's happening in the ring. And when I was a kid, you know, I had siblings. And so if I'm actually the natural leader, they're all following me. And, but as we get older, you, your ring changes and it's, and its scope evolves and it could be in the classroom. It could be at your first job. And over time that ring has 
different scope and it has different influence and different impact. But as you make a progression, the impact and the number of people that are actually in that ring keeps growing and keeps evolving. And so I, I, I find that in all the different stages in my life, wherever I was always working, there was always like a ring that was continuously growing and expanding. And sometimes it was inside of a big company. Sometimes it was inside of my own company, but there was always a group that was working with me and wanting to like help make the vision that I had established make happen. And maybe it's a solving a problem in the company. Maybe it's making a new initiative happen. Maybe it's, um, you know, fill in the blank. Either way, uh, there was always a mission. And in that mission, uh, either it was assigned to me or I came up with it, but I was able to like get others to want to help make it happen. And now in, in my own startup, you know, having, you know, raised a couple of million dollars and having, you know, team members and many investors and shareholders, they're all part of the team and they're all kind of like part of that journey. And so it, it keeps changing and it keeps evolving even and it ranges from you know individual contributor to having your own company. Uh, and so for me, I, I think I, I define it as having a vision and having people that want to support it and help to make it happen through thick and thin. Uh, and, and so in, in those cases, uh, if you're a leader, people actually want to uh, follow and support and and also, like, they have no problems pushing back, right? If they don't agree, they're going to push back because nobody you know, has all the right ideas. And, you know, when you're a, a good leader, you're actually leveraging the best of everybody. You can't actually be, you know, perfect in everything. And so in that case, being able to, like, leverage everyone uh, and, and have everyone, you know, in, in if I add the crew metaphor, uh you know, row in unison uh, to actually make make that initiative happen, and that type of alignment is uh, easier said than actually done. Uh, and so, uh, but yeah, no. So I I I I, I would say that I, I'm a leader. <laughs> it feels thank weird you, to say that. You. It feels it feels weird to say that, but you know, I think I've been told by others that I am. So <laughs> it'd be weird for me to argue with you on it. <laughs> I, I'm going to ask the other three panelists to, to share a little bit your your perspective of what what defines your leadership. Sophia, you want you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, at Alton's Power, we actually uh, treat all employees and empower them to be leaders. Um, you know, of course, I'm on the executive team, so I'm on the leadership committee. Um, but you know, at Alton's Power, we I think it's the culture of the company to basically lead by example and encourage, you know, inclusion and making sure everyone speaks up. So our model really is like, there's no idea that's a bad idea. Um, and we encourage everyone to come up with new ideas. Uh, we support new ideas. Um, from, we have very junior people who just graduated from college. Uh, some of them have come up with like amazing ideas to help grow a certain segment of the business or a certain way to attract new customers to our business. And we empower them to like take this initiative, add a few people to their team and actually make it happen. Um, and I think it's super rewarding to have a group of people where, you know, it's not just the seven executives of the company who are coming up with all the ideas, but everyone is contributing. Everyone feels empowered and it makes them more passionate about their jobs as well. So I, I can't think of one person out of a company who's actually not a leader. Um, that's that's how we that's how we envision leadership. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Yunsha, you want to say a few words? Um, yeah, this is a, a question I think a, a lot about. Um, I think uh, I you I thought I thought that I was a leader because uh, I I have always been in the leadership position you know, during schools, right? Like, a, you know, a president of the student union and other type of leadership positions back in China. Um, but uh, after I came to the US uh, and especially working for so many years, I struggled a lot with leading teams and with leading project initiatives. 
And so I was like, uh, what happened? Uh, is it like a leadership works differently in China versus in the US uh, or is something wrong? So I thought a lot. I still don't know if uh, I really have a good answer, but but now I think, um, you know, uh, my reflection is like, I think uh, um, Humphrey put it really well. It's someone who can put up a vision and can execute it and have people uh, who is willing to follow you. You don't have to be leading under a, an authority, right? You, you don't have to be a president or you don't have to be a leader, but uh, uh, other people are willing to help you and uh, follow you to realize that vision. I think that that is a great leader. Um, so yeah, I think like uh, when I was at Harvard actually, I had this idea of uh, you know really study the future of co-regions now under this whole clean energy movement. I just had the idea, and then like uh, eventually like talking with many people, professors and and students, I was able to put up that study group, and we had like organized a series of discussions uh, with like government officials, uh, industry practitioners, academic professors. And we had a great conversation and um, insights out of that. I mean, those are, I think, the basically the visions put into reality. And I was basically just a student there, and but I was able to pull everything together and made it happen. And so that's when I feel like, okay, you know, this is maybe what a leadership really is. Um, but I have a long way to go, uh, <laughs> a lot to learn how to lead effectively. Thank you. That leadership is a never ending. Uh, you, you can never say, hey, I'm a leader. I don't need to learn anymore. It's a lifelong journey. Uh, you, you never, never actually get there. Nobody ever get there, really. Uh, it's a, Eric, you want to add, add something? Sure. I think that being a leader um, is, is actually being able to affect how other people you know, work and also uh, how to generate more benefits. Right, and then there are different uh, sort of contexts for different leadership. Right, when you're leading a small team, let's say ten people, then you, you might be like very hand on, and you are sort of taking charge and exactly like doing like doing work essentially that people don't want to work work on, and then sort of like really being the middle of things. But when you like start like leading large organization, like a hundred people, then you start to have to like essentially lead through others, right? Essentially empower other people and other leaders within your team so that they can affect the people they are working with. Right, and then and now you, if you sort of go up to like a thousand or more, then really you you, you I mean just like a, a, a sort of like a, a general who's just staying behind, right? You have to see a, the, the large picture, and you really can only sort of affect change like what Sophia was mentioning, like through culture and really making sure that you're creating an organization that actually can uh, sort of move toward the direction the vision you set out, but that doesn't require like your like details sort or of like the guidance. Right. So, 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 so basically, I, I guess what uh, I've observed is that you need to be aware of the different contexts of leadership and actually be able to transition from like one stage to another stage. Because if you are sort of leading like a thousand people and you're still trying to be this kind of hands on guy who actually gets to you know, review every line of code, then no, that's not a very sustainable way of uh, leading that uh, 1000 people. Right. And then a lot of times that, that's the hump that you have to go through as you go from stage to stage. Uh, the, the quality of a good leader actually changes over time as well. Thank you. Thank you for, for the panelists to share, share your own perspective. Uh, if you hear all the four panelists uh, talk about uh, leadership, uh, one common theme I, I would clearly come through is uh, leadership is not about you. Leadership is about the people you are leading. That that's a that's a mindset uh, I, I hear from all, all, all of all, all of you. Really, is talking about how to uh, the ability to inspire, ability to influence others to turn your vision into action. So really, you have to think about leadership. Uh, really, is is about the people you are leading. So uh, thank thank you. Uh, I I'm gonna uh, ask one more question before I turn open up the the. Uh, a uh, session for, for Q&A from, from the audience. The last question I'm going to uh, ask uh, uh, maybe Sophia to start is, uh, it's maybe more dear or close to, to this uh, particular community is uh, that Asian America or Chinese America, especially in the, in the corporate world, uh, 
uh, it has a lot of different challenges uh, uh, versus the general population. Uh, obviously, I'm referring to, to the culture of working in the U.S. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, leadership, in terms of the, the so-called glass ceiling. All, all those uh, uh, challenges this community face. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Sophia, what, what are some bamboo, of the bamboo, bamboo ceiling? Bamboo ceiling, okay. <laughs> bamboo ceiling. What What are some of the uh, Sophia? What are some of the main challenges uh, from uh, your experience uh, this community face, and how you personally actually overcome those those barriers or challenges? Yeah, thanks, Jinjin. Um, that's a good question. I think early on in my career. Um, so one of my early jobs, you know, I was a you know, a first year associate at a large law firm uh, doing M&A transactions, working with partners on like, you know, multi hundred million dollar deals. Um, and it was interesting. What I observe is, you know, a lot of the Asian associates um, that I saw working, like worked really hard. They stayed late. They put their head down. They delivered, you know, terrific, um, you know, drafts of different acquisition agreements, purchase agreements. Uh, even though the work product was, was excellent, you know, they didn't speak up a lot about their successes. Whereas I saw, you know, our counterparts, you know, the non-Asian colleagues uh, in our group who also started uh, with my same class, which was uh, the first year class at uh, Paul Weiss at the time. You know, you hear them openly talking about how, oh, I killed it, or yeah, I closed that transaction, and you know, how great I am. And I just found it really interesting that, you know, Asians, um, from a cultural perspective, possibly, where I think, you know, even for my own parents, you know, taught us to just do the work, work hard, you know, don't make waves, you know, don't speak up unless, you know, you have something really important to say. Whereas, you know, counterparts that were non-Asians had no problems uh, patting their own back, you know. So you could hear a partner saying, hey, you know, um, Sophia, you did a great job on that deal. And instead of saying something like I would normally say, which, oh, it was a team effort and everyone did a great job. You know, the other uh, associates would say things like, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm so smart and I did such a great job and you should put me on my next, you know, on your next deal. So I, I think I quickly learned and just observed. It probably took me like a couple of years to see like, the disparity amongst kind of the, the cultural perspective um, and was able to kind of like learn how to navigate that. But I think it's because I had great mentors. I was lucky and I had terrific uh, mentors, a couple of partners uh, in m &A group um, kind of took me under the wing and I kind of learned from them like how to handle a lot of these different types of conversations. But I just wasn't used to that atmosphere because same as an MIT, you just kind of there doing your problem sets and getting your grades, you're not out there saying like, you know, how great you are. And I realized like self-promotion is like a huge part of each job. And there are ways to do it subtly, uh, ways to do it so that you're not really like bragging, but still making sure you get the recognition you deserve. Because, you know, another thing I learned is that people who, you know, complain more, are also compensated more. So for example, people who are asking for raises, asking for additional bonuses, are usually the ones who get them. And the ones who don't ask are not getting them. And people don't realize that you have to speak up in order to get, you know, some of the um, awards that others are getting. So I think it just took time to like figure this all out. So I would just advise, you know, people starting the career to just kind of pay attention to what's going on around you. And sometimes you might have to toot your own horn a little more than you're comfortable doing, but it's, it's important to adjust. Not that you should change your personality, but just keep in mind, you know, what needs, uh, like what information needs to be shared with the leadership team so that they know your contribution and make sure you're, you know, valued as much as you should be valued. Thank you. Thank I'll, you for the I'll, microphone. Yeah, yeah I'll go ahead. Add one, I'll add one thing too. Um, I don't know if you guys have come across the book yet by Gora King um, called Unspoken Rules, uh, but yeah. I highly recommend it. Um, he's a, you know, second generation Harvard College and then Harvard MBA, but he basically has put together a playbook to help Asians, you know, better succeed in the real world because we tend to, as a general rule, um, I don't want to overgeneralize, but, you know, in school, we know what to do to get a good grade. But when you graduate, it's not as clear what you need to do. 
And so, you know, like I saw Dr. Stephen Moe's question about like bamboo ceiling. I mean, at the end of the day, like you can't leverage the MIT card to like help get a promotion. I mean, you actually need to have the people feel like you earned it and you deserve it. And then they do it for you or they're worried that you're going to leave. Right. And so the games that people actually have to play in order to climb the corporate ladder uh, and, and I shouldn't even call it games. But it's easy to view that as games. But, you know, it, it is like to Sophia's point, you, you're always advocating for yourself. You're going out of your way to help people. And you understand who the decision makers are. You know who the influencers are. And you go out of your way for the betterment of more people than just yourself. And so those kinds of things end up being very clear. And a lot of times what I find is that as Asians, we tend to be really good workhorses and workhorses are like really productive, but, you know, they are not the ones that are looked at as the natural people that need to keep rising to the top because they, you know, they have cultural values that end up, you know, being, you know, they're not outspoken. They're not complaining. They're not angry. They're, you know, and so all those things make for a good worker. Uh, and those things actually backfire and uh, in, in a way like, anyway, I recommend that book because it actually gives you a framework to think about how to navigate the corporate world because it's very different from our culture. And it's also very different from what our parents have taught us because our parents knew what they knew in Asia, but they don't necessarily know what's here. So they don't even know what they don't know. And, and so in a way we're kind of, uh, you, know, you know, without the aid of mentors and guides, you you kind of are you know out 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 there in the jungle on your own, and and it's a lot harder to to, to succeed. Thank you, thank you, Alfred. Eric, you want to add add something? Yes, I think it's very important to actually, uh, as Thomas said, to the mentors. So uh, so having mentors you now who have been there, I mean, and, and then who can sort of help you and sort of. Uh, Understand the context of the uh, sort of the work environment, um, and so 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 what I observe is that um, a lot of times um, people do not sort of network as much uh, you know, from from Asian background as as, as they they could uh, in in the work environment, right? And you really need to go to practically say you know go out and reach out to people and and talk to people and and learn you know what other people are doing and what they're focusing on because a lot of times opportunities come along from like hearing about, oh, there's this new project that's coming along, or there's this new exciting area that the company is moving along, right? So, so um, to, to really get ahead, you, you need, need to essentially uh, be able to view the, the challenges that the company is facing from like a higher level of management, right? I mean, if you were a general manager, you should really think about you know, what challenges the company is facing as a, as a VP or even as a CEO. And, and to get that perspective, you really need to talk to people and, and sort of like learn instead of just focusing on your task you need at hand. So, um, so having that curiosity and also having that uh, initiative to go out and sort of like create your own personal network in the company. And, and, and this doesn't need, need to be um, like very like a tit for tat type of like uh, helping each other to do like a certain task or things like that. And just, just a general information network. I think that's, that's very valuable. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, Yinshan, you, you want to say a few words before we turn yeah. the panel over? Um, all great insights. I think the only thing that I may add is that I think there is, because of the culture, there is a tendency to follow the rules to say yes, and there is a, a less coverage uh, um, to push back. And, but I think sometimes actually the ability to push back in a good way actually would act one, like a fight for what you deserve and to show your leadership, right? Like how you can actually redefine things. Um, but I think uh, Asian communities tend to feel like uh, pushing back is a negative thing that you are, you know, like a, you're, you're not like a team player and therefore tend not to say say no to push back but i think that's something that probably um should be you know viewed in a more positive way and learn how to do that artfully thank you 
the the I, I'm going to try to summarize what what you said. Uh, actually, it's very much aligned with uh, mm, the there is a uh, I forgot the name of the organization South Asia uh, of Science and Engineer. They did a pretty extensive study of uh, what are some of the co common challenges the Asian uh, professional facing in the in the corporate world. They, they end up uh, they, they identify this uh, four thing. First one is the organization savviness. The second one is the career risk taking. Third one was the communication skill. The last one was, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but the, the one really resonant with me was uh, uh, a lot of Asian uh, we, in, in the corporate world that we don't take enough risk in terms of career decision, career moving, or even business decision. We tend to, uh, the follow the rule, follow the convention <laughs> round. Uh, uh, that that's identified as one one of the main barrier. Uh, the, from an internal perspective, actually, when I was talking about my book, uh, leadership book in the Shanghai Club, we spend a lot of time talking about self awareness. Uh, the way I see it is, we are who we are, and we are never going to change into somebody else. Uh, so we are going to be different. So the, the first part of the self-awareness in my mind is to start with the self-acceptance. We are who we are. That's our value system. That's what we believe. Once you have the self-awareness, now you are going to have a self-confidence that leads to leadership. The, the, I define the self-awareness uh, uh, four parts. First, understand what your leadership value is. What's your value? Two, what's your strengths? Third, what's your weakness? The fourth is to understand the context of your work. Means uh, not just to understand the why, what you're doing, how you're doing, but why you're doing the work you are doing. That gives you a lot of context when you communicate with the others, when you engage with the others in, in terms of the significance of your work. Uh, I read something a few days ago about this, uh, I, I forgot, I think it was a Harvard Business Review, con uh, I forgot who's concept, uh, who was uh, writing this, but there is a big difference between self-promotion of yourself versus promoting the idea. Never be shy in terms of promoting your ideas. You don't want to, to be, you know, to self-promote yourself, but uh, in terms of promoting your idea, you should have the courage of conviction to promote your idea. So that, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, I, I think putting all the, uh, the, the, the panelists' uh, so different examples in, in, in some, some way in terms of how that go back to leadership, how do we demonstrate leadership in, in this complicated world with a, a lot of uh, barriers, you know, the bamboo ceiling or whatever ceiling there for, for this community. We, with that, uh, I, I'm going to, uh, we, oh, by the way, uh, I'm not sure about the panelists, but I'm going to stay here as long as uh, we have a question. Hopefully the panelists can also stay a little bit longer in terms of question. So if uh, the audience have any question, this is the time to ask. Uh, uh, Mona, I don't see the... the There's oh, uh, seven Q&A questions. Yep. Oh, seven Q&A questions. Now I see it. Let me try to go, how is the bamboo ceiling affect your career promotion and to reach the senior executive in your, how do you play your M? I think that way, you know, we, we already discussed it somewhat. Uh, what are some ways you stay most up to date with the innovation in your area? Uh, let me have uh, Erica, you want to take out the next question? What are some ways you, you stay most up to date with the innovation in your respective field? Uh, sure. Um, I think I think it's important, as I mentioned, right? I mean, about developing personal network. Of course, you can uh, read up on you know, journals and like uh, industrial like publications and things that, and that's very important. But um, I find that usually the most effective way of sort of keeping up is actually uh, developing network. Like I mean, like for example, for research disciplines, right? There are uh, industrial or academic conferences that you should go and really get to know people and and, and get to get involved and volunteering like program committees or like. Uh, uh, or like uh, like review committees and things like that, and 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 in in sort of industry, um, uh, so, uh, I mean there there are I mean different. I'm, I'm from computer science side, right? So computer science, I mean there are essentially a lot of uh, 
online resources already for all the technology development. In fact, overwhelming. I mean, if you look at how much you know AI is actually advancing uh, over the past few years, right? So, 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 so you have to be selective and and just uh, really get a broad view and then sort of do a deep dive only for the areas that that you really need to uh, sort of focus on. So, so, so I will rely on uh, sort of like a, a large network of people who actually can help to. Uh, sort of feed essentially interesting information. I share it like in corn development as well. And I think I think that's another way of uh, so sort of staying abreast because uh, it's easier to sort of go far if you have a group of people that uh, can help each other. Thank you. Uh, the next question from uh, JJ Tan. Uh, maybe Yingxia, you can uh, do, you are probably the 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 one uh, you answer a little bit this question for JJ. What advice would you give to someone currently looking for a new career opportunity in the current job market? Well, I, I guess the, thanks for the question. It is a, a little bit unclear to me in what aspect that your uh, your question is about. Um, but in general, I I think the current job market probably differs a lot by industry. Uh, you know, like in the clean energy industry that I am in, it, the job market is very hot. And and so I think the question is not uh, whether there is a potential job op career opportunity or, uh, or not. The question is uh, which one, which direction do you want to take and then how do you prepare yourself uh, um, to, to, for that opportunity? Um, but in other industries, and especially if you're in China, I think uh, when the economic goes downturn and uh, there may not be that much opportunity, I think the question is, uh, how do you then like still prepare yourself so that either you can get a good opportunity, even though there are not that many, or prepare you yourself for, for something else? So um, yeah, I don't know like uh, which one, but I think you, it probably requires a little bit more specific context to to, to give you some more helpful um, advice. I don't know Thank if you. other Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Humphrey, you want to answer the next question from I yeah. Iris? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Iris, you know, asks about like, hey, you know, there's so much happening in AI and there's uncertainty. And how do you strike the balance between, you know, being confident and clear um, in the midst of change? And I think the way I think about this is uh, earlier in my career, I was always so focused about like what I needed to get done that whenever like a headhunter came knocking on my door, I would just completely ignore it. And what I realized is that that's actually a really dumb thing to do. Because, you know, your timeline and what you're thinking doesn't necessarily line up with like when the opportunities like knock on your door. And, you know, when we have an MIT degree, we end up being like valued and sought after. And so I adopted, I changed my view to be opportunistically reactive, which means like you can have your own view, you can be confident, but you should be open minded and open to considering new things and also new ideas that might actually change it uh, because sometimes those things can like change your life completely and it's hard to not to know what you don't know and when someone is telling you something or like giving you an opportunity or giving you a new angle you know it's okay to be vulnerable and listen and figure out how that might change how you're thinking so I think it's always in general good to be confident, but it's also really important to be open-minded. And that's kind of where that term opportunistic reactive comes into play because that could apply to your current job. That could apply to someone you randomly meet and you have just no idea where that stuff can go. Uh, so I, I think in general, uh, it just like continuously evolve and uh, take that data in and and adapt and and change. So I don't think you need to pretend to be more confident than you are because you know with OpenAI and ChatGPT, the world society is being disrupted. So nobody knows exactly how it's going to change. And so with all this uncertainty, everybody is actually uh, experiencing the same thing. And some people are just showing it more than others in terms of how they're really feeling. Uh, but, you know, these are very real and tough 
times. And the nice thing about having an MIT degree is that we can figure this stuff out. We can evolve and, and there's people who, who actually who want you and, and are looking out for you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Humphrey. Uh, uh, by, by the way, Lloyd uh, had, had a question. I think it's a little bit unique question. He is from uh, Australia and uh, working in China. So it's the reverse problem we're discussing here. Lloyd, I just typed a note. Uh, you know, uh, reach out to me. Let's have a separate conversation. I think it's a fascinating topic. Uh, the, maybe we, we can discuss uh, uh, offline on that question. Uh, the next question, Yin Chen Liu, uh, what, what are some of the things you regret not doing during your time at MIT? I think it's a fascinating question. I, I had a lot of things so I probably regret that I did not do, but uh, let's see. Uh, Sophia, you want to answer that question? Um, that's a great question. I thought like I did so many things at MIT. It was such a fabulous experience. Um, that the, probably the things I should have spent more time on are really spending, I guess, um, more time maybe trying out different classes. There were just so many amazing classes to take. I had a hard time each semester narrowing it down. So I think, you know, during IAP, for example, it would have been a great time to like kind of uh, load up on additional things to try. Um, I feel like, you know, school is the most fun environment and it's the biggest opportunity to kind of learn new things, which is why I relished the law school experience as well. And I think I took what I learned from MIT by just like kind of taking a lot of extra classes when I was in law school, like uh, like packing my calendar and I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad I had that opportunity. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, great. Misty, next question. Has uh, your emotional connection to China ever influenced your career direction? Maybe I'll try to answer this question. I, I obviously I've grown up in China, uh, spent roughly about half my life in China, half in the U.S. I came to the U.S. Uh, uh, 88, uh, did my Ph.D. when I was 27 years old, so a little bit late uh, in, in my uh, I, I remember when I was at MIT, the same office, we had a graduate student 10 years younger than me. I was 27. Next next desk is a 17 year old. We were in the same same graduate class. So. So uh, you ask, you know, what's your emotional connection? It, it's, uh, I, I'll share a couple of examples. One is, uh, uh, obviously, on the one hand, we discussed earlier, being a Chinese American, being, a, a, the, you, know, uh, you know, we quote unquote outside has a lot of a challenge. But on the other hand, uh, it also, if you take it differently, it's also an opportunity. Uh, for example, the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, I, I was at ExxonMobil. I was uh, the uh, global uh, VP for, for ExxonMobil's uh, uh, technology licensing business. Turns out the licensing business, half of that is in China, because China is the only place building a lot of things. Uh, other places are pretty much you <laughs> run. So that give, give me a lot of uh, unique things that I could do, go walk into China, do doing talking to people, reach out to people, other people could not do. And after that, uh, around 2017 and 2020, actually, uh, I was leading ExxonMobil's investment uh, in China, $10 billion investment. Uh, again, it's a, you, you say, is there a co emotional connection? Obviously, there is a connection that that's never going to change because I've grown up there, I have family there. But it's uh, the question is uh, how do you leverage that the emotional connection in your work? How do you take it you, that emotional uh, with, with your career? I I find uh, you know, if you f take that again, it's a self acceptance. You are who you are. That's a, you know if you view that a, that's a, a strength, you'll take that as a strength, leverage that strength to do something about it. If you view it, that's a hey, that's a that's a negative uh, versus somebody else. Uh, then you are going to try to hide it. So the key uh, come back is you still you need to have the strong self awareness and take who, you know, know who you are, what you want to do, what's important in your in your life. Uh, uh, that that's that's you no know, that that's uh, that's how I, I would share my experience in, in terms of the emotional connection with the China. I, I spent about uh, three months. Uh, this is summer in China, 
of course, I, I retired. I'm not working anymore, but uh, came back. I actually shared a long article on LinkedIn about the, the economic uh, uh, pulse uh, about China. Actually got a lot of uh, uh, interest in different groups. And some people asked me to explain what's your view in China. So all those things, uh, I, I think the emotional connection is always going to be there. The, the key is what what do you do with that emotional connect, uh, connection, either through your life or through through your career. That that that's my my perspective. Uh, let me see, what's the? It's partially. I'm looking for special. Oh, looking for specific actions and what her mentor coached her. Uh, I think this is a still question for Yinxiang. I'm not sure who, who this uh, um, question is directed to. And anybody wants to answer? It's basically about the special, specific action uh, about what, oh, for Sophia. Sophia, you want to answer that question? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so the mentor at the law firm, you know, I think the most valuable thing I learned um, for the mentors is really uh, what Eric talked about earlier, which was building a network. So, um, you know, I got a chance to the partners um, to kind of work with the partners who had kind of the most uh, visible deals at the company. So whether it's like really large Fortune 500 companies or really interesting transaction, I was able to get on those deals by being introduced to these different partners. I think, you know, that was one thing that helped make me stand out because um, you know, when I worked on a deal and it closed, there was a lot of visibility about the work that was done. Um, and it was hard to kind of get on those deals without knowing those partners in advance. Uh, another thing she taught me was really to speak up. So like, oftentimes in the beginning, in the first, you know, a few months I was there, I would be in these meetings and they'll be talking about, you know, a complicated transaction and how to structure it. And I always kept myself kind of silent and not really speaking up and just kind of listening to other people because I was kind of afraid to be the one to say um, an idea, you know, worry that it might be the wrong idea or it might get laughed at or something like that. But eventually, over time, I built the confidence to kind of speak up uh, more frequently. And I think that really helped um, the career path as well, because, you know, I realized that by speaking up, you kind of take more risk um, and it makes you think through things more. And then you get more appreciated as well, because, you know, they know that you have kind of sound advice and that you really you know, trying hard to like solve the problems presented to you. And I think having that reputation plus the network, you know, really helped helped um, kind of move me along in, in, in that field. Okay. Uh, I, I think that's all the question we have in the, in the chat. Uh, any, any other question from the audience uh, uh, so you can, I guess if you want to ask, you can still, still ask or raise your hand. Uh, and by the way, while we're waiting, um, I would like to make an announcement for the MIT Chinese Alumni Group. We are looking for additional volunteers to help out on the programs together with Shinjin and myself. So uh, if anyone's interested in joining the board to help come up with new programs that uh, we can schedule for 2024. And we're also looking for, um, we're planning our first in-person Chinese New Year event in New York City. Um, and so anyone who has a interest in playing a role in shaping and defining that experience, we're, we're looking for volunteers for that too. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure which screen is sharing, but uh, please uh, jo join the MIT Chinese alumni uh, group uh, if, if you are you know, uh, find the panel panel discussion useful. Uh, let, let's all thank all the four panelists for a wonderful discussion and share their experience. Uh, and also I want to thank Mona and Marie to take the, take the evening time to help us to uh, make this uh, activity work. Uh, and uh, thank you for all from, uh, from all of the, I have no idea where you are, but China, US, all over the place, uh, uh, taking the time to participate in this uh, activity, appreciate it. Thanks so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take Thank care. Thank you Bye. all.